So the real reason all of us are here is how to get more, uh, get the most from Specto as a bowler and a coach. So, um, so introduction, we already uh, kind of talked about who we are. Uh, Rick is obviously a gold level coach. He's been at the training center 10 years now, I think, isn't it? Yep, coming out on 10 years in February, actually. This uh, is coming so February. Only nine. Sorry. Nine point something, yeah. Yeah, so almost 10. And I've been here a few more years than that. So, and I'm the director of coaching tools. Um, I'm also a coach in my spare time and everything else in needs to get done. And so. you have lots of spare time, right, Brent? Yeah, I just sit around waiting for the phone ring. And you also go out there on the professional tour and use Specto on the PBA tour yep. on every stop, right? Yeah, I get to sit next to Randy in every uh, stop and kind of feed him information and make sure he knows what's going on and help tell the, help him tell the stories that are uh, kind of what's going on in lane. So. And that's one of the big ways Specto's really become more obvious to the people around the world is seeing it on the PBA tour broadcasts mm -hmm. and seeing how players attack the lanes differently and yep. Specto records all that data mm -hmm. and uh, it really opens up people's minds as to how difficult and how different bowling is from what they may have thought in the past. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to spend most of our time today talking about the mobile app. We do also have a coaches app and if you're coaching primarily with it and you use your computer at the bowling center, I would encourage you to use the coaches app and I'll talk in a couple minutes about why. But after you get logged in, you choose your bowling center, you choose what lane you're on, uh, you come to this menu and there's three different choices for how I can practice. We're going to go into more detail of how I can use those practices, but I'm going to give you a quick intro to each, what each section is right now. So Worlds, what Worlds is, is a guided practice. It's a lot like, uh, it's gamifying practice. So if it's kind of like the Angry Birds version or the, uh, uh, Angry Birds is probably the best example of uh, your favorite game, right, Brent? Uh, I used to play it a lot. I don't play it quite <laughs> as much anymore. I found I was spending way too much time on my phone. So, um, but there's two different ways you can kind of attack it. Like, uh, like for example, me and my mom, when she ever she does Angry Birds, she won't move to the next level till she has perfect three stars. For me, I'm a low achiever. As long as I get one star and it lets me move on, I move on. So, uh, it, but it helps kind of guide you through a practice, the different right. worlds, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, have different focuses, but if you're not really sure what to practice, it's a good place to start, and it kind of will break the mm -hmm. game down into, like, for example, the very first level um, is just keeping the ball in the lane. So. Yeah, it starts really simple and easy and then progresses to more difficult levels, and uh, I think it's also kind of fun. Yeah. Exciting. The next area we have is challenges. Uh, if you haven't tried these yet, uh, what they are basically is it's a, it's a quick one task, um, and all the ones we have right now are based on how many times in a row can I do something. We've got two different ones. We've got speed ladder, and then we've got the um, 710, uh, the master of corner pins. We've got the master of corner pins challenge. So uh, those are both, uh, the nice part about those is if I'm not, if I just want to focus on one thing, which both of those things are important for all players uh, to get better at. So uh, it's a quick, uh, good way that I can challenge my buddies or we can challenge other people. Yep. Um, online too. So. All over the world, right. Mm -hmm. And then the area that we're going to spend most of the time talking about today is performance. So the main uh, difference with performance is it's uh, just numbers, which this is where kind of the intimidating part of the uh, spec though, because some of the feedback I've gotten from coaches and players is, yeah, I see all the numbers, they're really cool, but I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with them. So they kind of um, will... Uh, scare them a little bit. So kind of what we're going to talk about today is what should some of the numbers mean or what do the numbers mean and then what what do I want to get? How can I practice with them? What changes can I make or what can I look for to get better with them? So. Absolutely. So this is the coaches app. Uh, we talked about that before. Um, so if you're coaching regularly you can see there's a lot more categories. So I think it's up to 40 some categories that you have to choose from. You also have the ability and you can see on this screen now you can overlay a pattern on top of it. Uh, if there's topography in the center, which there's not a lot of them that have it measured, we can overlay the topography on there. Uh, we can customize and put as few or as many categories as we want. Uh, there's also a line markup tool that's really cool, so you can um, actually turn on uh, a trajectory, uh, kind of like the torch would be the reflection back. This right. uh, gives you like a visual on the lane, so you can get uh, some feedback of the part of the lane you're playing and the direction you're trying to play. Yeah. So. Now, right now on the screen, you see a whole bunch of categories there. It looks really busy, and there's lots of data. Uh, that's pretty nice, especially if you have an advanced player who really knows a lot about the game and really wants to deal with all these different factors. But if you've got someone who's more of a beginner or an intermediate player, you can remove these, a lot of these columns and bring it down to maybe two or three uh, main issues that you want to focus on with someone who's a beginner player. And so you can make this as simple as you want it to be for a beginner or intermediate bowler, or you can make it as complex as you need to for an advanced player or a PBA star. 
that's what I love about this spec tool. In the past, most of our teaching tools were all complicated for advanced players, and Spectre can be tuned or adjusted downward or upward based on the person's level of skill, mm -hmm. their level of expertise, and their knowledge of the game. Absolutely. So if you're coaching regularly, I would encourage you to try this uh, app. I think it'll give you some flexibility uh, and some different features that are very def uh, definitely helpful in coaching. Uh, to find all of those, in case you don't already have the programs, we have a link on our website uh, where you can go to your uh, your app store in your either your iOS or Android if you're on your phone or if you're in the Windows. You do have to have a Windows 8.1 or greater because it's in the Windows store, so you just go to the Windows store and search for Specto Bowling, and you should find it that way. And I think, Brett, if I'm right, there's no ads in Specto, right? Nope. And there's no uh, payments, no fees, right? Uh, not for the individual users, no. I mean, there they would pay the bowling centers depending on what structure they have right. set up. So, and then the owners of Specto have like a yearly fee to keep up with the updates and keep up with the uh, cloud management. There you go. So, so now we're going to get into the meat of what we're really here to talk about, and that's what do the numbers really mean? So uh, I'll kind of introduce this and let Rick take it, but really when we're coaching, uh, like I said, I am also a coach as well, um, there's basically two things that primarily we're trying to focus on. We're either trying to work on somebody's consistency or they're trying to work on their versatility. So the way I kind of put it is first you got to learn it and then you're going to have to learn to uh, make adjustments to it. So right. um, I'll let you kind of elaborate a little bit on that and what, when you're coaching, what, how you're using it a little bit. And yeah, I think consistency for. really is the starting place for most people mm -hmm. to keep, be able to keep the ball in the same zone in the lane, be able to adjust their, their game and, and repeat shots over and over again. That's the key for all of us who we're struggling with, and we do most of our bowling lives. But then once we get that pretty much narrowed down to a pretty a pretty decent range, then it's all about becoming uh, the getting the ability to adjust to different conditions. And that requires that versatility that you mentioned, Brent, where you have to learn how to adjust your ball speed, maybe your axis of rotation, mm -hmm. uh, play different lines, play different zones on the lane, um, combine that with your speed and your power, and your revs. Uh, so all those things have to be uh, aspects of the game that you juggle mm -hmm. and that you can tweak and, and play with. And Specto allows you to certainly work on consistency. It's really good at that. It also has, uh, through the worlds and other aspects of it and the, the competitions, the ability to, to play with your versatility and, and challenge yourself uh, against uh, the numbers on Specto, which we're going to talk about, and also challenge yourself against other players, like mm -hmm. we talked about uh, around the world in both consistency and versatility. So it explores all the important aspects of the game, and that's what makes it such a powerful tool. Yeah, yeah, because the one thing about it is it's uh, it's objective. I mean, it gives you exactly what the numbers are. You can't argue with it. I mean, I know Absolutely. for me as a coach, I like it because then I don't have to be the bad guy. I can let Specto be the bad guy because exactly. I can tell this player, uh, no, you didn't hit 10, you still hit 12, or oh, you didn't hit this speed. You just, uh, so it, it gets me off the hook, and I don't have to call him out. It does it for yeah. me. Yeah, and Specto can also be the good guy, and in, in that it's going to tell you some areas of your mm -hmm. game that are strong, that are really strengths that you have right now. And most everybody has some strengths that Specto identifies, and I've found that most players, when they come here to Kegel for a lesson, they're only thinking about their areas they want to fix, their weaknesses, they're not very aware of what their strengths are. So Specto, I think, is one of the important aspects is telling people, teaching bowlers what their strengths are so they can focus on those and lead with those strengths as they're working on becoming better at consistency and versatility. Absolutely. So this is the mobile app. Um, there's three different settings that you can look at the data on. You've got six data points, 10 data points, or you've got a scoring um, module. Uh, we are integrating, we're still in beta testing with it, but we are using, we're integrating with Lane Talk. So if your bowling center has Lane Talk enabled uh, and they're set up through us, you would actually see your name and your score as well. Uh, but it, there's 10 different categories on here. All of the categories are listed on our website. If you go to spectobowling.com and then look under the frequently asked questions, I believe the last question is what do the different specto terms mean? So if you're not exactly sure, you can go and look at all of them. I'm gonna only comment on a couple of them real quickly because I think they're the ones that we use a lot. Um, arrows, I think most players, arrows is where they're aiming at, uh, at least in the beginning. I mean, as I think they become more advanced, they may start using different targets in the lane. But generally speaking, I think most players use arrows. So that is where the right. ball's at at 15 feet. Uh, and then the other one that I think is probably the most important category, 
um, that I know I use a lot, and I'm sure you use it even more, is launch angle. And that's really being able to control what direction we do. So a negative number means it's going towards the gutter or away from the pocket, however you want to look at it. A positive number means it's going away from the gutter or towards the pocket. So in the front part of the lane, you're going to see a negative number. Uh, and then that's the opposite of that would be the impact angle, which would be the uh, direction the ball is going into the pen. So I like to look at what direction they're throwing it, because a lot of times I actually had a player downstairs that I was using an example. His laydown point was exactly the same for two shots in a row, but his uh, because his launch angle was, I want to say it was 0.3 off, he was two or three boards different down lane. So it was mm -hmm. a huge difference. So. Yeah, players ask me all the time, what does launch angle really mean? And it really, to me, it reflects your the angle of your swing plane. You know, the swing goes back and forth in a, in a pendulum motion, and the direction of that swing plane controls where the ball goes. So launch angle, it can, like Brent said, it can be away from the pocket, which would be a negative number of degrees, like in a compass, or it can be a positive number of degrees where it's going toward the pocket. But it's that angle of your swing, going back and forth, back and forth. And if you have the, the same angle every time, the ball is going to go the same place every time. And that's what we're looking for. That's that consistency we were talking about. And it controls that, so it's one of the most important factors in bowling, as Brent said. So this is a key aspect of Specto. Um, one of the most common problems we see here at Kegel is people that don't have straight swings. The swings go behind their back or bump out away from their body. Their, their launch angles or swing planes change almost every shot, and that really destroys their consistency and ability to repeat shots. So launch angle is uh, finding out how to have a consistent launch angle and seeing your progress on Specto from each time you test it to the next time is going to show you your progress. And uh, that progress is going to be one of the keys to making your game the best you can be. Yeah, the other thing with the launch angle is um, people will ask, what's the right number for it? And it's all relative to the part of the lane you're playing. Because a lot of times, uh, when you get players specifically that get locked into where they, they're really good if they're in between the second and third arrow, but they can't play the first arrow, they can't play the fourth arrow, a lot of times what's that tell, what that tells me is, uh, if I go back and measure, it's because they don't change their launch angle, so they don't know they don't know physically what to do to adjust that. So now their ball motion, uh, they can only get the ball going one direction. So learning to be able to adjust that is also a really big thing. So because yes. I mean, it, it would be nice if we could always stand in the same spot and look at the same spot and be able to throw the same angle. But I think all of us understand that in most environments today, it's not who through the most number of accurate shots that wins. It's the guy that adjusts and stays ahead of the moves and makes the least mistakes in reading the transitions. Mm -hmm. So, and I think adjusting, being able to control and adjust that launch angle is the number one key. Yeah, Brent, as you said earlier too, you have to have the right alignment for that launch angle to be consistent. So a lot of times because we perceive the lane in a different way, we actually see the lane is shorter and wider than it really is. Mm -hmm. We don't pick up the right alignment with our bodies to the line of play or the intended path of the ball. So launch angles get off because we have to make those compensations because we're misaligned. Like you said, standing on 25, th trying to throw the ball to 10. If you actually hit that line, the ball would go in the gutter. Uh, you have to make a compensation to keep it on the lane, and, and many of us do, and we do it pretty well, but not perfectly. And uh, if the alignment's right and the launch angles are correct, you're going to see really, really consistent gameplay. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we do with every, for, the first thing we do with every lesson is we do an evaluation, which if you look across the bottom of the screen in the mobile app, you're going to see live data, which is where you see all the numbers. You're going to see my sessions, which is any of your recorded stuff, and then you're going to see your evaluations. Uh, inside the evaluations menu, which is what is on the screen now, on the left side of that top is the different uh, evaluations that the program has. On the right side in the upper top where it says my evaluations is where you would go find yours. So first thing we always start with is an evaluation here because we want to be objective. Plus it gives the player a chance to warm up a little bit, gives us a chance to kind of just watch with our eyes. Uh, there's two different types of primary evaluations that are inside of here. We have the ball performance test, which we'll talk a little bit more about what that is, but you can probably tell by the uh, name that it probably has to do with what they Rick? Arsenal. Arsenal oh, yes, bowling balls. Yes, bowling balls. Those, yeah, bowling balls. Those are a little bit important in our Nobody game. cares about those, right? No, no, never. <laughs> So and then the other one that we do a little bit more uh, that we use the most is the ranking sessions. The difference between the 5, 10, and 15 shot uh, is really just the number of shots. There's no difference in the way it analyzes the data. It's a bigger section. Um, so a lot of times when we're doing, if I have like a large group, I'm going to do maybe the shorter session because I need to get everybody through quicker. If like in some of the camps, we actually use the longer one right. because we want to get a, a good set uh, a good set of data to kind of get an idea of what that player is. And we've got enough times. We've also got 12 lanes worth of spec though, so we have some flexibility. Um, 
so that's what we're going to start with. I think it's a good for uh, people to do regularly just to kind of, I think you said the baseline yes. is what you like to use yes. for the most. Yeah, when I do a lesson uh, here at Kegel, every one of my lessons, I conduct pretty much the same way at the beginning. We have the player warm up on, on the lanes, check the approaches, check their fit, and then start throwing some practice shots in their favorite part of the lane. And once they feel comfortable, they've gotten their body warmed up and ready to play, we have them do one of these analysis sessions, the five shot, 10 shot, or 15 shot. And my experience is they really, all of them provide a pretty accurate uh, analysis of the player's game, even though they may be different in length. We usually, I usually start with the 10 shot baseline. And this is before any kind of training that I've done. I'm just gonna look at their game uh, as they play and I'm gonna have Specto and analyze the game by the data we collect. And that's our baseline assessment. So they throw 10 shots, trying to make everything exactly the same. They stay at the same place on the lane. They use the same bowling ball. I ask them to use the same release, the same speed, same rev rate, uh, all those things keeping the same. Don't adjust for the pocket. Keep throwing the same shot down the same line every time. So whatever the first shot they, they make, I want them to repeat that same shot nine more times, even if it goes through the nose or if it isn't in the pocket, it doesn't really matter. Specto is going to measure their performance no matter what. So once we do that analysis, I print out a report, which you're going to see here in a minute. We sit down together. And I go through all the different parameters that Specto measures. And again, my objective is to show them where they have strengths and make sure they know what those strengths are. Mm -hmm. And also to show them where the key areas of improvement are going to be at. And many times it's going to be those launch angles we talked about a minute yeah. ago or some other factor like that. In bowling, there's really three key elements we talk about here. One is direction, which is the launch angle aspect. One is certain amount of ball speed is required in today's modern game. And also a certain amount of revs are required today to be competitive, especially if you're going to bowl in college or on the professional tour. So those things are all measured by Specto. And I go through that with the player. And then at the end of that session, they have a good understanding of where their strengths are. Mm -hmm. And they have a pretty good focus on what we're going to work on for that day. And then it's my job to help them find out a way or some techniques to make those areas of improvement get better. And we do that by also looking at our video system, video analysis system as well. Absolutely. So now what we're going to talk about is some different sample reports. And what um, Rick is going to talk about is how he's interpreting these reports. First, what I want to do before we do that is I want to just kind of go through the report real quickly and kind of give you a breakdown of what the structure is. Obviously, the piece at the top is pretty simple. Uh, it's just a picture of their ball paths. Exactly. Um, one important thing on there is the blue, the red, and the green is showing their skid, hook, and roll phases. So it's measured by when the ball is changing direction. So Specto knows because it can get a reading about every foot, depending on the ball speed, about every foot. So it knows when there's any change of, ball off, change of direction off that straight line. So then it can measure, and then it also knows when that change of direction stops. So it's actually calculating where my skid, my hook, and my roll is. So that's a good uh, visual up there. It's good when we're trying to teach ball motion. Um, you can see, too, on a lot of times uh, when somebody misses left, and even in that chart up there, you can see when they miss left, obviously the ball stayed in more oil, so that skid phase is a little longer. And then some of those other ones that get a little further out, there is one further out there that looks like that's still blue for fairly far down. But most of the outer ones, they get red way sooner, so you can mm -hmm. see that skid to hook phase uh, happens a lot sooner. And then also the ones that get further left, you can see they actually roll a lot sooner because they get into the, once they do make that motion, they make it pretty quickly. But the top chart there, there's uh, several different categories there. Um, below those, we show the average, the range, and then we show a target there. The target that's listed there, it'll have an L and then a number next to it. Uh, once you have thrown more than 30 shots in Specto, it assigns you a level ranking. Now, once you've thrown 30 ranking shots, so once you do three, uh, three 10 shot reports or uh, two 15 shot reports, it assigns you a ranking based on where your numbers fit uh, an average of all of your different categories, which we'll see a little bit lower. Um, but in the, your first time doing it, it just shows you an L0 because technically to the system you're an L0. But later on, once you've done several of these reports, those numbers will reflect what the level you're at. So you can see if something, if you're at the level for what you're at or if you need to improve that. So. Right. And then in each of these, uh, what I'm 
on some categories there, I'm looking at the average. Some categories, I'm looking at the range. Some categories, I'm looking at both. Like, for example, ball speed. I want them to be consistent, but I also know for somebody to be competitive, they've got to have a certain amount of ball speed. So like in this one on the screen, it looks like the launch speed's 14.1. Depending on the level they're trying to be competitive at, it could be tough to be competitive with a 14 mile an hour speed. I mean, if they're trying to win out on the PBA tour with that, it, they would have to be throwing it really good and be making really perfect moves, have perfect ball motion, and that's probably not the ideal speed for what we want to see there. Exactly. Um, but the consistency of that, I want to say it looks like 0.8. So the consistency is not great, but it's not horrible. But that's an example of one of the categories that I care about both equally. Some of them I only care primarily what the uh, what the range is. Like I'll use launch angle. I care more about what the range is. I do need to know what the angle itself is because I don't want, like in this instance here, they're negative 1.2. If they're negative 1.2 and they're playing 5, 6, 7 board at the arrows, then I'm probably going to be in trouble because uh, it's probably going to end up falling in that channel every once in a while. So, But the top part of the report there gives you some different categories and gives you an average and a range. So I'll usually kind of highlight and based on what I'm trying to look at with them, uh, I'm going to go over different ones. And then the bottom part of the report is where the meat of it is, where most of the interpretation, where most of the stuff that Rick's going to kind of give us some insight on is done. So you see the categories there. The yellow below are your numbers. And what the system does is it grabs and highlights the green box that's closest to yours, or it's the next one, uh, the, the green box that's the highest level you would get to before you get to the next one. So the lower the green box is, you can see the levels on the left-hand side. Level one would be... Uh, 150 or below, and these are based on sport averages. Right. And level six would be professional. So the lower the box is, the better it is. The higher the box is, the worse it is. So in this instance, for this player, um, it's going to be their weakest area is their laydown point. Their strongest area is their RPM consistency. So um, and then there is one category on there that uh, called loft distance. I wouldn't really use that one. Um, it, the the standard deviation for the error from the uh, sensor itself, because it only measures that when it sees the full bowling ball, um, and depending on the color of the bowling ball and stuff like that, it can it, it can affect that window slightly. So we usually ignore that category. Um, we're going to have a new report out sometime by the end of the month and or beginning of next month, uh, and that actually category it's still technically in the coaches app, but we're not going to be using it to it right. anymore. Right, exactly. What do you mean the other report in the in no. the future? Nope. So um, now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. So uh, I see all these numbers. Uh, I kind of know, I know what they mean, but why don't you kind of tell us, if you see this report, what are some of the things, how are you going to interpret this? What are you going to do? Well, the first thing I want to do is look at my own scores here in yellow or the player scores if I'm coaching someone. So those are the scores at the very bottom of the ranking session there in yellow. And there's seven categories we look at. The first category over in the far left is lay down point. Now, what I've done beforehand is I've asked the player, what's your current average back home? And let's say they're saying their average is like 185. That'll put them in category level number three uh, or level number four, actually. Well, three because it's probably hot. Yes. Average. And uh, so I find out where they're at and I circle that level. So this is their base level. If the green bars are below that base level, it means they've exceeded their average. If the green bars are above that level, it means that's an area for improvement. Mm -hmm. So I kind of establish that baseline that way. So like in this first category of lay down point, I explained to them that's where the ball first goes on to the lane. And if you look at the graph up on top of the, of the ball paths, you see that the in most people, the lay down point is very narrow. And then as the ball travels down the lane, things get wider and wider apart and there's more variation. So the lay down point's the first category. And I look at the uh, right above the yellow scores, you can find level six, which is the professional level. And that's what I compare them with. I say, oh, how close are you to the top players in the world who've done SPECTO? And that's what they want to know, of course. So in this category, the person has a score of 3.5 boards, a variation at the lay down point, which is pretty wide. And the pros are have a variation of only eight tenths of one board. So a big, big difference there. And, mm -hmm. and that's why category one in, in this particular re recording is the weakest category. The green bars at the highest level. And the higher the green bars means the category means that they need more improvement there. If the green bar was low, that means they've done well or closer to the pro level. So in this case, the first category laid out point is their worst category, as you can see on the screen. And they've gone quite a ways away from 0.8 with their score being at 3.5. So they have a relative now reference point of, hey, how good am I? 
and how far away am I from the top players in the world? Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, of course, still, how do I get closer to the top players in the world? But at least now they know where they rank and uh, also where they rank against their current average back home. So for a player like this, I mean, if you see that, what are some of the key things that you know that you're automatically going to start doing when you do the physical game? Well, first of all, I'm going to try to find out if they're sliding at the same place or they're mm -hmm. lining up at the same place. Some people don't pay much attention to their setup, and they actually put their, their foot on a different board every time they get up on the approach, or they have a different amount of drift as they go to the foul line, and they're not aware of that. So one of the things we can do is say, okay, are you setting up in the same place every mm -hmm. time? Are you going through a good setup procedure? Or do you have a drift that varies versus a drift that's consistent? So those are some of the things we can look for. Uh, but again, I go back, before I do that, I go through the whole process here. And I also have taken some video while they're doing mm -hmm. their, their 10 shots. So I have a video analysis I can go through and look and stop action everything to start analyzing where the root cause of the problem might be in Excellent. this case of laydown point. The second category, the next column there on the right of the laydown point is the arrow position. Again, we're measuring consistency of how many, how the shots are, how much variation is there from one shot to the next of the 10 shots they make. And we're making that uh, comparison again to the pros. And if you look here on the screen, the pro score in at the arrows, about 12 to 15 feet out there on the lane is a board and a half. One and a half boards, all 10 shots fit in that small area of a board and a half. And our player got a score of four boards. So again, quite a ways away, although this time put him at a better level. He's at level three now, better than his first category, which he was at level two. So we can say oh, I'm a little closer to the pro level, but still not really where I want to be mm -hmm. as far as my average and not where I want to be as far as getting better. So that's how I look at that. And they can see, OK, these are areas I want to see improve. Uh, I'm not horrible, but I certainly have some room to grow in these areas. The next area is pattern exit. And that's one that confuses a lot of people. Pattern exit is really where the oil stops on the lane. So, for example, on a 40-foot pattern, the oil would stop at 40 feet down the lane. And most people know that it's uh, 60 feet from the foul line to the head pin. So that's about two-thirds of the way down the lane. The oil stops. After that, there's dry lane. And we're measuring what the ball is doing at that, at that exit point where the ball leaves the oil and goes on to the dry lane. And, again, here, uh, this is an interesting number I always think is – the pro score here is 2.9 boards at the pattern exit. You know, I thought the top pros would be have an area about a width of a pen uh, or a size of a dime down lane. But they've got almost three boards of, of area down lane, and that's what top players are looking for is area. So the pro score is 2.9, but our player here has a score of 6.6. Uh, so he's, uh, he's more than double what the pros are. And so there's room for improvement there. But, again, in this category, though, he moved another rank down lower on level. He's down to level four now, which he's probably at his average now. And that's not bad for this player. So we can say here, we just want to keep you solid here or, or get better. But this isn't really a big area for improvement based on your score. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the next category, the fourth one over from the left, is the entry board. This is where the ball goes actually into the triangle of pins at the end of the colored lines there where you see the green lines on some of them. And now the pro score has gone from 2.9 boards down to 2.5 boards. So on the pro level, the ball converges on the pocket and the variation gets less. But in our player's case, he was at 6.6 .6 at the pattern exit. At the entry board, he was 10.7 boards. That's over two arrows, isn't it? Yeah, in width. that's a big difference. So a lot of variation there. And then again, they can see uh, wow, I'm quite a ways away from where I want to be. That moved him back up to level three. And they say, wow, this is another area that I need to improve. And those first four categories are always measured in boards. There are 39 boards across a synthetic lane. So we're talking about measuring in those boards and how much variation there was. And we see on our player, he had a variation of from 3.5 boards up to 10.7 boards. So a top player would have a variation of 0.8 to 2.9 at the most. So there's a, a very easy comparison to make about how I'm doing compared to the top players in the world. And I think that's a really powerful tool to show someone, give them a really clear reference point mm -hmm. about where they stand. And again, it's not my opinion, not the bowler's opinion or yours or mine, where right. it's actual data from yeah. a LIDAR laser that's tracking all the ball path mm -hmm. down the lane. 
All right, the next two categories are my favorite ones because I think they're the most powerful ones. Uh, Brent mentioned earlier it's called launch angle is the category right after the uh, loft distance, which we're not going to be using. And uh, this is the angle of the swing plane. The pro score in this category, it, which is measured in degrees like in a compass, is 0 0.6 degrees. Uh, the, in other words, the variation of the swing plane doesn't vary more than just barely a half a degree. And that's a very tight, tight grouping, in my opinion. A half a degree or six tenths of one degree, just barely over a halfway point, is, is pretty amazing that the top players have that kind of a swing plane. In this case, the player we are measuring here has a 1.0 degree uh, variation in the swing. And that put him up at level three, quite a ways away from where he wanted to be, and also not at his current average. So again, launch angle here would be a key area to improve. And my experience is when you make launch angles better, the first four categories uh, measured in boards get better also. So launch angle controls or affects the first four categories we just talked about. So to me, I'm going to circle that launch angle category with my player and say, this is what we're going to be working on today a lot is to get your launch angles more consistent. Well, it's been your experience too, Brent, with the uh, launch angles. Yeah, more often than not, launch, almost every lesson is focused a lot on launch angles. Yes, my, figuring out what because they're either aligned wrong because they're so they're doing they've created compensations and then I got to figure out a way to strip the compensations out of their game to get their consistency to be better. Um, but it's usually that category right there usually yeah. tells it all. And when you're on the PBA tour doing the broadcast with uh, all the guys on the on the broadcast booth there, Randy and so forth, we see you see a lot better launching. Oh yeah, you? they're super consistent. And when they're not consistent, I can usually safely guess that it wasn't a miss; it was an adjustment. So they were yeah. trying to change zones, or they were trying to get the ball to go to a different spot. So right. theirs won't be varying because, oops, my swing messed up that time. It doesn't happen very often. Yeah, those guys. and their alignment usually is not off either. They're not standing on twenty five trying to play at ten. So again, the pros are, have learned by experience, learned by not being able to win on the tour that, hey, certain things have to be really in tune for me to be competitive out there, and launch angle is one of the key aspects. Mm -hmm. The next key aspect is launch speed. How consistent are, is your speed from shot to shot? Um, and a lot of people are pretty good at this. In this category here, our player did pretty well. He was at level five, the highest level he's done so far under launch speed. But the pro level is, again, at 0.6, 0 0.6 miles per hour. That category is measured in miles per hour. So just barely over a half a mile per hour of variation in the 10 shots from the lowest speed shot to the highest speed is just six tenths of a mile per hour. And our player had a score of 0 0.8. So pretty close to it, uh, putting him at level five, which is a 195 to 210 average level. And that's his best score yet. So we can say, okay, this is one of your strengths. Here's where you actually show some real talent, and this is something you want to play to and, and recognize as something you do really well. So we want to keep this at a good level, and that gives someone a little bit of encouragement now. They haven't done so well so far, but now I've finally got a strength I can hold on to, and I can say my mm -hmm. game has got some, some real potential here with this skill that I've developed over time as far as launch speed. And why is launch speed so important? Well, if you have launch angle, that tells you where the ball is going to go, right? Launch speed determines when the ball is going to break off that line and move to the pocket. So if my speed is consistent every time, the ball is going to move off that launch angle line at the same place, end up at the same place at the pins. If my speed is inconsistent, you can see the ball is going to start off earlier, maybe go farther left or start off later, and maybe not even get to the pocket. So speed is a, the second most important factor, in my opinion, as far as being able to be consistent and, and playing the game well. Makes sense. All right. All right, then we go to the last category on the report, which is RPMs. And people confuse this category a lot because they're, they're eager to know how many revs they have, and they're eager to have more revs, which is one of the reasons people come here to Kegel to train. But this is really not how many revs you have. It's how consistent your rev rate is from shot to shot during the 10-shot assessment that you just did. The pro score for rev consistency is actually 60 revs. So from the lowest rev shot to the highest rev shot, the variation is 60. So if someone had a shot at rev rate of 320, the highest rev rate would be 60 more than that, be 380. So that's the range you'd see. And in our case here, this was our player's absolute best category. 
He beat the pro score by quite a bit. His rev rate consistency was 19, one of the best I've seen in my time here, actually. And again, the pro level is 60, so he was way better than the pro level at his rev consistency. And often speed and revs go together. So you see these last two categories are speed and revs, and you see both of those categories were this player's best ranking of the entire assessment. So that shows us that his release is probably pretty consistent. He's not overhitting at one time and underhitting at the next. His speed's not going up and down like a roller coaster. Right. Those are his big strengths. And if we can just keep those the same and work on launch angles, we're going to have a, a big improvement for this player. Right. The other thing, and you'll see on the screen that he only related this as decent revs, but you said a second ago that it was one of the best you saw. The other thing that you do have to pay a little attention to on these last two categories is what the absolute numbers are. Exactly. Just like we talked about earlier already is – yeah, he's very he's pretty consistent, more consistent than most, but his speed is only 14.1 or her. I don't know if it was he or right. her. Uh, and then the rev rate, too, 19 is good, but keep in mind that their rev rate was only 153, I think it was. So 19 of 153 is still great. I still would like this player. I, I'm still going to work with him and try to get it. But there's probably some room for improvement on both of those categories as well yeah, Absolutely. that I can make some improvement there. So there's yeah. sometimes you got to dig a little deeper into what the actual numbers are to kind of make some uh, guesses and some uh, interpretations there. That's true. So we got another report here. Um, and so I'll just, you know, we obviously don't have to go through every category again this time, but let's kind of walk through the process that you use. So the first thing you said was, what do you do? I have them throw 10, ten shots right. and we sit down and get Funny the report. Once you're interpreting the report. Yeah, right. we, we go through the categories looking at their yellow score first, mm -hmm. the YOU section down there. And seeing how they're, and again, I tell them the lower numbers are the better scores, of right. course, kind of like in golf. Uh, and then we compare those uh, looking at the green bars, the lower the green bars are the strengths, the higher the green bars are the areas for improvement. And one thing on speed I wanted to mention, and this comes up a lot with my lessons, people uh, are used to seeing their scoreboard indicator on the, on the score boards at home, oh, yeah, that's uh, and that's measuring the speed way down by the pins. And once the ball leaves your hand, the ball speed is always slowing down more and more as the ball goes down the lane. In fact, if the lane was long enough, the ball would kind of cruise to a stop. Thank goodness the lane's not that long. But the ball is essentially slowing down. So by the time it gets down to the measuring camera down by the pins, the ball speed is slowed down usually three to three and a half miles an hour from what it was off your hand. And Specto's measuring more a uh, more accurate level of speed here. So we see a little bit more ball speed on Specto because we're measuring it closer to the release point or more accurately throughout the lane rather than just down at the pins where the ball speed has gone down to its slowest, right? Right. Yeah. So that's what confuses people. They say, well, my, my ball speed at home is only 12 miles an hour. You're saying I've got 16, and that's because we're measuring it at a different yep. location. Okay? Yep. So here we are with a, another player who's oh, got – I see a problem with this person already. Go ahead. They're well, left-handed. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank goodness you're not, right, Brett? Yep, I'm right-handed. <laughs> Well, I'm a little bit of both. I, I write left-handed and I bowl right-handed, so I kind of I, I dodged the bullet there, didn't I? <laughs> and now all the left-handers are chatting in the chat box, and both can be fired. Uh, so this is a, this person's got a great speed control. Uh, their rev rate consistency wasn't as high. Here's an example where revs and speed didn't quite match up like they often do. And on this one, uh, the big thing that stands out here is what's missing. There's a, a couple of columns there that have no green bar, where that means that the person is off the scale, up above the level of the lowest category, level one. And in that, one of those categories happens to be the launch angle, which is the most important factor in bowling. So right away, this, this report is screaming at me, let's get find out what's going on with the launch angles with this bowler. Yeah. That's the big deal here in Absolutely. this one. Okay? So. so right away, I see what the problem is. And right away, the bowler and I are going to be looking at his video saying, wow, we need to find out what's going on with launch angles. So it gives us a real clear focus right away as to what we're going to work on that day. So which view are you probably using when you're specifically looking for this problem? Which camera are you looking for? Side view, front view, back view? What are you looking for? Front view and the back view. Front I want to back. see I want to see the swing plane. I want to see the okay. angle of the swing, see if the swing goes behind the back, see if the swing bumps out. Again, that's the most one of the most common problems we see at Kegel is swings that don't go straight back and straight forward. We want to see the ball line up at the top of the swing with the head uh, and stay aligned and then finish close to the ankle at the release point. And that usually constitutes a good launch angle or a good straight swing. And that's one of the most premium uh, factors you can have in bowling is a straight swing. Again, it's one of the most common errors we see here. Absolutely. 
let's go into another report here. So this one's another lefty, so we're, we're being fair to him. We're going to beat them up as much as we beat the righties of up. Of course. So this report's a little different, so you see different green categories. So Yeah, here we have uh, the rep consistency is one of the strongest areas because the green bar is low over there in the far right category. They had a score of 79, and again, the pro score is 60. So you can see they're pretty close to the pro level, uh, not far from that, that uh, top number of level six. And the pro, I think, pro level on the tour is probably around an average of 240 plus. Uh, you know, it's essentially on our scaler, it's anything greater than 210. But I think, Brent, on, on the tour, 210 wouldn't really do much out there right now, would it, on yeah, the professional tour? It depends on the, the pattern that's out there. but Yeah. So it's a, it's a higher average. Let's say it's a higher average than 210 in most conditions, yeah, all right? for sure. And so, again, we see the green bars that are toward the top are in the two most important categories again. They're in launch angle where it's at the 150 level or less, and they're in the launch speed category, the two most important categories, because they control, again, where the ball goes, and they control when it breaks off that line to the pocket, and those are the two things that are going to determine where the ball is, is going to be uh, down the lane on every shot. So uh, I would really work on that. Now, this person also had a pretty good score, not a bad score anyway, on the laydown point. You can see on the, uh, the ball path indicators on the lane up top, that it's pretty narrow at the start there, but you see uh, quite a few outliers as the ball gets down by the pins because of the inconsistencies in the launch angle. Okay, so again, we have a similar issue here with the with the the, the uh, ranking, but I think this gives the player a real good way of getting in touch with this mm -hmm. and and kind of buying into the fact that okay, this is where my problem lies. Now let's go down on the lane, look at my video, and see if we can find out what really is happening to make it. Mm -hmm. Um, be this way. Is it probably also safe to assume in an instance like this when their laydown point's a little bit better and relative to the first report we saw that the laydown point was really bad, that this yes. person's probably not as much footwork as that first person was. Exactly. This Mo is definitely more swing or more body alignment and things like yes, that. Yes, more s shoulder rotation, swing, mm -hmm. head movement, and the feet are probably not as big an issue, although I will look at them mm -hmm. carefully, but it's probably not going to be as important as the category, and that's another thing that the speculate even gives us a little hint about these subtleties, mm -hmm. doesn't it, yep. as well. Yeah, and once you get, and we remember, we've looked at thousands of these reports, so uh, this is stuff that you'll learn, and you, as your field of experience, and you do more and more of them, even good players, if you're, even if it's somebody you're not working with, a lot of times any good player we have come, come here, do you mind to inspect them for us? And it's not that we're, a lot of times we're just trying to get an idea of what's their strengths and weaknesses and what makes them the type of player they are, so it also gives us a reference point. It keeps us honest, too, whether is this pro level really the pro level, and I'll tell you, most of the guys that are making money out there regularly that come in and do this, it's pretty close. Yeah. So I think once people start seeing how this relates, they see their score and they see the pro score right above their score and they can start making those comparisons. I think even though there's a lot of data here, they really start getting in touch with it. They really mm -hmm. start enjoying Absolutely. comparing themselves to the top pros and they get a real clear feeling for what this means versus before it was kind of like a lot of numbers. I don't know what they mean. Yeah. But once you get this comparison going, uh, people get really excited about Specto. Yeah. Kind of puts everything in reference. It so we got another one here, a little bit different issue. So, yep, we have uh, we have a, a variety of uh, success in the first four categories on, on the measures and boards, uh, from the laydown point to the entry board, uh, and you see the entry board is the worst category in the first four, and then we also see again launch angles are way up there at the top at the level one category for this player. So launch angle again. Their score was 1.3, uh, and the pro score is 0. 0.6. So they were twice, more than twice off what the pros do at the launch angle level. They had much better speed control, which has been a pattern so far. But again, here's another example where speed and revs are not consistent. We have good speed control, but the rev rate is out of control up at level two. Uh, so, uh, and you can see on the chart on the top, uh, a lot of outliers, a lot of uh, errant shots at the uh, down by the pins, uh, the ball is going away off target, uh, at least maybe 10 or more boards. So uh, a lot of variation there in our direction and consistency. Uh, again, being able to repeat the same shot, that's not what's happening here. And again, it's mainly because of the launch angle. And, the, and as we talked about a minute ago, if you look at the front to the lay, lay down point, it's one of the better categories. So it's pretty narrow at the lay down point, but it gets very, very wide down at the pins, so we're going to be looking at swing issues again, shoulder rotation issues, 
things like that rather than mu as much uh, with footwork and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's probably safe to say also on this one, too, that I probably need to get that person's fit check, don't you think? I think so, yes. Yeah, if, they, if they're that consistent with their footwork and obviously their feet, their feet are consistent in the direction they're going and the tempo they're going and their release is fairly inconsistent, I'm certainly going to check that fit because you can see some of the uh, problems with the down lane isn't that they're throwing at different directions. You can see that ball, there's a whole bunch of different shapes down there. So there's a good chance that they're not getting the ball off their hand the same way. So that's right. We probably should spend a quick, uh, take a quick look and double check and make sure that, that fits pretty good. In addition, we can also go back. Specto does contain some more detailed reports on each of these categories, showing each of the ten shots in detail. Mm -hmm. So I can go back to that area uh, and see uh, if there's a whole bunch of like roller coaster up yeah. and downs in that area of the release. But it, we often find here at Kegel that that people have uh, releases or or fits that aren't optimum. And we need to go back and adjust the fit because if we don't, they can't do what we're asking them to do. Right. Uh, and they're not going to have the spectra report that we want them to have. So fit is crucial. You can't really outplay a fit that's not good. Let's get another one here. I think this is your before, middle, and after, right? Yeah, this Something. is an actual lesson I did with the player. And this is the nice thing about Specto. We do this baseline report. Uh, as they come here before any training is done, any direction is giving as far as what to do differently to improve your game. And this player, as you see here, was has a lot of green bars toward the top. Uh, they had one that was really good, which was the rev consistency. Again, they beat the pro score in this category. But everything else, including the two most important ones, launch angle and launch speed, which were the worst in this category or for this player, are, are quite a ways from where we'd like them to be. So this is how they came here. This is how they how they began. And, you know, if a person saw this and I went through that with them at the very first, they could be kind of discouraged that, wow, I'm, I've got a lot of work to do. This is going to be, you know, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe I should take up golf instead of bowling, you know. Uh, but as you're going to see, with a little bit of work, you can you can be amazed at how things are going to improve when you find the root cause of the problem. Right. And the clue here is to see what Specto is saying to us. And then combine that with the co coach's eye and the video system that we have and the experience of the coach. And then we can work on some things. And why don't you flip to the next one, Brent, if you want to. And we'll see well, an inter intermediate one. I want to put you on one. the spot first here. Oh, go ahead. Do you sure. remember specifically kind of when you interpreted this report, some of the things that you worked on before you got to the next section? I know we didn't talk about that. Uh, well, you're good at this. almost always the, we find that the, the issues are in the setup in the first two steps okay. in most for most players. So I always look at the setup. I think that's where the shot is made. Uh, so I always take a close look at their setup. If their feet are lined up parallel to the intended path of the ball, if their hips and shoulders are kind of perpendicular to that ball path, I, mm -hmm. I want with their body angled out away from mm -hmm. where they want to throw the ball. So I have to make some kind of a compensation. Uh, and then I also look at those first two steps to see where they're going. And if the, if the first step crosses over and it's way out of line and the, now their body's having to drift way left, mm -hmm. that has a huge impact on all these factors, especially launch angle. So looking at the setup in the first two steps is really crucial, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I go through the entire approach with the person. I make a recording of all this, and I'm pointing out again always the areas I think are my strengths for the player, but also the things I think are impacting key areas we saw in mm -hmm. Specto, like launch angle and launch speed. Nice. Okay. All right. So here's an intermediate one. We still have some uh, Specto green bars that are up there toward the top, but you see a dramatic improvement already uh, in launch angle and in launch speed. And we still have really good uh, rev consistency. So we didn't lose the rev consistency, but we made some improvements to the two most important categories, launch speed and launch angle. And that was probably from making some of those adjustments. Uh, in the setup and uh, maybe in ball placement if a swing was maybe a little bit out of, out of alignment I don't remember exactly on this player which the issues were but oftentimes if I just have them you know if you see the ball sticking out this way away from their body in the mm -hmm. setup or they put the ball into placement way to the left or to the right instead of straight in front of their shoulder you're going to see launch angle issues mm -hmm. so we we started working on that and after a few minutes we do a second analysis after we've done some training and then we see this improvement. And then at the end of the lesson, we do another one. And look at the big difference here. Huge. Now, keep in mind, the one that has the green bar sticking up there is that loft distance that we don't count anymore. So ignore that top green bar. And in this report, every category is at the 195 level or above. So she has four at the pro level, 
the 210 or better level, and three at the 195 to 210 level, which is a huge dramatic impact. Why don't you go back a couple of slides and show them that first one again, Brent? So I think this player was happy when they left. Really happy, and so was the so was the coach, right? Yeah. When I can get this kind of improvement from somebody, we're both going to win. Right. We both have a good day, and their their belief about wow, I've got a long way to go. At the end of the lesson, they made a huge improvement. Right. Now they don't own that improvement yet. It still requires they go home and practice, right. and then groove this into their game so it becomes automatic. But at least it's within their skill set. Mm -hmm. They know they can do it. Right. Specto's proven they can do it. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's a big, big win to be able to show someone this. And again, it's not my opinion. I'm not saying yep. I'm not fluffing them up and saying, oh, you mm -hmm. did great today. You're wonderful. It's raw data from an actual measuring system yep. that we can count on and is very accurate. Yep. So we had two twos, two threes, two fours, and a pro. And partway through, we had one two, four threes, one five, and one pro. And by the end of the day, we had ooh, four pros. And three fives. Yeah, that's that's a little bit of a pretty good, pretty good improvement. You can coach you say? me if you can make yeah, me that I good. Yeah, if I could do that every day, I'd be. Uh, so is this person ready to go out on tour then, or what? I think they're ready for uh, for maybe some competitive bowling. Yeah, oh, okay. I think so. Very yeah, good. and that was their goal. That's one of the things I always do when I when I take a lesson and use spectos. I always want to find out what the goals are. Right. Sometimes it's simply to beat my friends on Thursday afternoon mm -hmm. in, in a practice session. Yep. Other times it's just to be my a better league bowler so I can help my team out. Other times it's getting ready for college bowling or I want to go out and bowl some regional PBA events and so mm -hmm. forth. So based on a person's goal, again, I can adjust what I'm showing on Specto right. and I can adjust my coaching so I can help them achieve whatever goal they have. Absolutely. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other reports that are in there. So we have the ball performance test. Uh, it's been out for about 18 months. Um, and as you can guess by the name of it is it talks about the bowling ball. So, I mean, I don't think anybody can deny that bowling balls are absolutely important in our sport. Um, so uh, this is a good, I think you uh, had a suggestion for the way you do it with a lot of players. Yeah, I, I love this test. And I don't, I don't think we explore this enough around the world anyway. Uh, I love using this here, especially for people who don't really have a good idea, which I think a majority of bowlers are that way. They don't have a good idea for how their bowling balls are different. And they've been kind of encouraged to get the high performance bowling balls, the top of the shelf ball, mm -hmm. the big hook monster equipment uh, based on what they see on television or whatever they are their favorite pros throwing. And so they end up sometimes with, with four or five balls that essentially do the same thing, right. the same trick. And so when you get those uh, balls together, at, when they bring their equipment here for a lesson, we put them through the ball performance test and we can see the differences between each bowling ball in many different ways. And that tells us, uh, I guess, if their arsenal is an effective arsenal or if mm -hmm. it's all five balls to do the same trick. Yeah. And it also tells us if there's some openings in their arsenal, some holes, we might be able to find another ball that will fit into that opening Absolutely. and complete the arsenal and make them, again, back to that versatility issue, make them more able to adjust different lane conditions mm -hmm. and different levels of transition. Because we all know, I hope, out there that every time a ball goes down the lane, that oil pattern is being changed. It never stays the same. So we're constantly having to adapt to an environment that's actually invisible, right? We can't see the oil except on the, the PBA events. We have the right. blue oil out there. But on the regular uh, competitive bowling events, there's no coloring of the oil. So the oil is changing, and there's no way for us to see it uh, mm -hmm. all other than by watching our ball motion and how the ball goes down the lane. So it's really, really important to know what different bowling balls do. Mm -hmm. and know when to pick up that bowling ball and when to use that bowling ball in the, in the sequence of transition that you go through. Yeah, the other nice thing about this report is a lot of times when you're bowling on a house pattern, it tries to make every bowling ball look the same because the wets are so wet and the dries are so dry that you can almost make any bowling ball work to a certain extent on a house pattern. But this can really, it takes that ball motion out a little bit, and it's measuring where the slowdown happens at, so it really helps you get a good idea of what the actual ball is doing. So. Um, as far as the report itself, on the left-hand side is the average of it. Um, it's a five-shot test. What I usually tell people, if you throw one really bad shot in there, you've got to redo the test because it is an average and it's such a small uh, range. Uh, I like to, if, if after four shots they have four good shots, a lot of times I'll end the report early just so I know that I've got a good uh, cross-section of data. Um, but you can see there on the left-hand side, you'll see the skid hook and roll again, so that same blue, red, and green fall path. 
but you see a straight line that projects out from that uh, initial launch angle. And then what that difference is off that line is hook board. So it gives you an idea of actually how strong that ball is. So we'll see some examples on the next page of a couple of different bowling balls. Um, but then the next category down is you see the angles. So there's that launch angle again. Right. Um, so we can see this. This also can help me understand the difference between two bowling balls is maybe for me to match up on this pattern, I'd use more angle on this ball than I did my mm -hmm. other ball. So it's also another hint there that maybe that ball's a little bit stronger. Gives you an idea of entry angle with the impact there. Or excuse me, impact angle, not entry angle. Um, the impact angle is the direction the ball is actually going into the pins. Uh, and then it also shows you um, your speed slowdown. So it shows you where the ball's losing the speed. So what is the speed related to? The speed loss It's related to where the ball's hooking. So if I right. see that one ball's losing more speed in the front part of the lane than the other, uh, than uh, another bowling ball, that indicates that that ball's stronger. Sometimes we've even did this with players that I'll do it before and after a surface change so we can get an idea mm -hmm. and they can start to visualize and understand what the differences of this specific surface change is making. So you also have some reference points on there. Um, these are there more for you to know with, when I'm trying to compare two reports. Um, I've got my launch speed and my RPM on there uh, to give me a reference point of if I'm trying to compare it to another report. Because if I have one bowling ball that's at 20 and another bowling ball that I did it at 19 and they're looking more similar, well, it's safe to assume that the one that was 20 was stronger because I threw it harder to get to the same results as the one that was 19. So uh, those are there for reference point. And then the chart on the right-hand side, I think is really powerful. And what that is showing is the angle and where the angle is happening at. So the uh, green is the uh, front two parts of the lane, so the heads and the mids. And then the blue or the purple, whatever color you uh, would call that, is the back end. So that's right. what's happening down lane, which you can see in almost every bowling ball, what's happening down lane is going to be more than what's happening in the front part of the lane. Right. So. And also, I like this report because in the uh, below those charts and graphs, you see there's some text down there, and the text describes these categories that mm -hmm. we're looking at and reminds you what they mean. So it's really easy if you look at those, and if you forget, just read the descriptor down at the bottom, and mm -hmm. you're back on track. Yeah, and see, these are three different reports that kind of gives you an idea, and you guys are probably, these are a little bit older. Um, these are actually right after we developed the... Uh, um, the report and we were doing some testing kind of trying to compare some different bowling balls you can see the pitch back black on the left so you can see the total number of hook boards um, and I can't read the number from here because it's too small um, and then we've got the code X and then we've got the intense fire and you can see the number one thing that I notice on these reports right away is that chart on the right hand side Absolutely. so that intense fire has way more total angle that it's covering than what the codex and the pitch black, which if you if you remember those bowling balls where you ever threw them, that makes perfect sense. I mean, that one obviously covered the most boards. Yeah. It was designed to, so. That's um, a very obvious color color discrepancy, isn't mm -hmm. there, in those, yeah. those uh, bar graphs there. Yeah. And see, even with the codex and the intense fire, you can see the amount of uh, green is similar. I mean, there's obviously a little bit different in the uh, intense fire, but the second category there, that blue ch uh, chart, you can see the intense fire is far more continuous down lay than a codex is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to see. I want to see dramatic differences between bowling balls. Mm -hmm. I don't want bowling balls to be very, very similar and close to each other. I want to see a dramatic, distinct difference from one ball to the next ball mm -hmm. to the next ball in my arsenal, which is what that's describing right exactly. there. Exactly. And then if you compare those hook boards too, because when I had the actual papers in front of me, I know the intense fire and the code X were definitely more than the pitch black. So, and yep. you'll be able to easily compare that. And then a lot of times if, if I'm not seeing enough differences in between these, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to start adjusting surfaces, and I'm going to look at the other variables that I have. I mean, at this point, I could see, still even think about putting weight holes or even plugging a weight hole potentially. Uh, long term, I won't have that capability, but uh, I can figure out, is there enough gap? Is there enough difference between them? And if there's not, I can make some adjustments. So then a lot of times, too, then we can also use this report when I first get my codex, I can do it. And then uh, we all know after 90 days, three months worth of bowling with a bowling ball, it's not the same thing. So we can redo that report and see, okay, how far different is it? And maybe it still has a place in my arsenal. Maybe it's not the same spot it was originally. And maybe I need to drill a new ball to fit the spot that mm -hmm. it was originally in. And maybe there's another spot that this uh, will uh, work for me. But uh, Or sometimes it's just a matter of changing the surface and getting it back to where it was to try to get those numbers closer to it. So it gives, it's a good reference point. I can always re uh, refer back to it and kind of get an idea. Yeah. And this gives us really specific data on how these bowling balls are mm -hmm. different. There are many places you can go to get that. And lots of times what our beliefs are, what we think is going on with a bowling ball, isn't the same as what we see here on the, on the report. So it gives us a much more uh, factual, scientific analysis of the, uh, of the balls. 
And to me, the big winner here on this, this ball performance test is just a whole different paradigm shift. Most of us look at the bowling lane from side to side and think that's the way we need to analyze the game. And this forces us to realize that really the most important thing is the front to back issues here. Mm -hmm. When the ball is slowing down, what kind of shape it creates down lane. So that front to back analysis is what this is bringing out. And I think many, many bowlers are, are not accustomed to seeing that or to using that. And that's, I think, where they really learn a lot by watching Absolutely. this ball performance test. So the other thing that I already kind of mentioned earlier in the day was we're going to have a new ranking report out. It's going to be out probably towards the end of this month, the beginning of the next month. It's going to have all the same data. If you, it's kind of hard to see because it's small on the screen probably, but you can see that same chart that we've been talking about this whole time. It's going to be in that bottom right hand corner. Uh, you can see there's a cat, there's not the loft distance in there anymore. Uh, I believe they put something else in there in its place. but uh, So you still see that same chart, so you're still going to be able to do the same thing. But we've also got some new things in here that we're introducing. And it kind of goes back to where we were talking about before with uh, accuracy and power. So one of the things is we've changed that top part of that report, uh, which you guys just, I mean, we've, we've been going over this now for probably 90 days. We've seen a couple of different versions. And uh, Anders done a great job of designing an amazing report with the help of Yuha and Orr of making something that really helps us get to what's this player's problem and get there faster so we can make changes easier. Um, so, and the accuracy score with the goals is just like golf. The lower I can get that, the better. So you can see um, the bottom one there is lay down, and then as you go up, it's going down the lane. So lay down, arrows, break point, entry board. And generally speaking, they're going to get worse going up, but basically they just sum all those numbers together and they come up with an accuracy score. So it gives me an idea. You can also see it on that chart there. You can see what their part of the lane that they have the most trouble. Generally speaking, almost everybody's going to be worse in the back part of the lane than the front part of the lane. But that little bullseye over there gives you an idea of what's their weakest one. So you can see that one category, which is entry board, is the furthest out. It's into that second gray circle, whereas everything else is pretty tight in that first gray circle, with one of them going out into that uh, that second white, uh, the second white circle. So it really helps us kind of have an idea of where we can make this player better. This is a fairly decent player. This was Orr, and I guess he can bowl a little bit, it looks like. So um, he's done okay. Yeah, I love the bullseye. It's so easy to, to see that, hey, we're trying to hit the center of the bullseye, and how close we came to doing that is very easy to mm -hmm. as, as ascertain here and, and determine. So I like that graphic. So and then that, and the next area is the power score. And if you see this number here, you're going to notice that, that if you've been watching the PBA telecast, it's using the same power ranking that we have on there. Uh, it's the exact same. I think we actually have a decimal point in it inside the app, which we're going to change them to both match. We haven't decided which direction yet. But inside the uh, app, it's also in there. But this is the power score. Um, the other nice thing about this report is it, it gives you an idea, and in this instance, he's a balanced player, mm -hmm. so he's not speed dominant or uh, rev dominant, where you see that yellow highlighting of this over the speed in the RPM. If he was a speed dominant player or an RPM dominant player, you would see that, that only that one would be highlighted. Speed, in this yellow. instance, because he's balanced, there's not a t change in there. You right. can also see that chart along the bottom. Um, where he was talking about with the roller coaster with speed earlier, you, that's his speed numbers. And you can see, okay, is there really big peaks and valleys there? And in his instance, of course, like I said, he's a fairly decent player, so his is fairly consistent. Right. And that being balanced versus being rev dominant or speed dominant would help you and your pro shop professional Absolutely. decide what ball is going to be work, workable for you and what layout is going to be helpful to optimize your game as well for different conditions. A big important factor there. Yeah, Absolutely. So another thing that we've added is this shot analysis. Um, so what they now can do is it decides what part of lane you're in. So it's dividing the lane down into four different sections, the outside track, the middle track, the inside track, and the deep inside track. So what we're planning to do with our players is have every player do a report in every zone. So this excuse me, identifies what zone they're in. So now we can start to compare their accuracy in different zones. Mm -hmm. So this isn't something I'm going to probably do with a player the first time I do a lesson with them, unless they're a high level player. But it's something if I'm working with a player regularly, I'm absolutely going to have them do one in each zone. And or if they're specifically preparing for an event. So like, let's say they're preparing to bowl the US Open. What's the part of the lane we know they're going to end up playing more than other parts of the lane? Probably deeper inside. So we're going to focus them on doing reports in that part of the lane. Or if they're getting ready to bowl on Cheetah, there's a good chance or something short. Maybe not Cheetah necessarily, but something shorter. There's a good chance that I want them focusing on uh, the reports doing the outside track. So yeah. it kind of will help us be easier to explore the different dimensions of a player as well. 
Yep, and if they're just a regular houseboat that wants to bowl their buddies on Thursday afternoon, we're probably going to keep them in the middle area, you know, somewhere. But if they're a competitive bowler, they need to practice in all these areas to be a competitive player. So based on their goals, again, or their the level of play, uh, you can prepare them by having them practice in different areas or keep them in their favorite area. And we all have our favorite areas, don't we? Oh, yeah. We like to play. So it's it's important to get out of your comfort zone sometimes and kind of force yourself to play in different parts of the lane and get comfortable everywhere. I like to have a player say, I can play anywhere in the lane and I can be comfortable and accurate and consistent on any level in any mm -hmm. zone. Yeah, and as a pro shop guy, I would even interpret this and use it, have them do me uh, do a report with me and show me the part of the lane that they're most comfortable with. And then that way, because this is a good example here, if I get a senior, for example, it happens quite a bit. They come in and, yeah, I want to be able to play down and in. The house pattern is not designed necessarily for you to play really well down and in for most house patterns. So, But this gives me an idea of that's where they want to stand mm -hmm. at. I have to give them the bowling ball that helps them do that. It might be urethane. It might be a really weak reactive. Right. And if their speed's slow enough, there's a good chance that it might even be a plastic ball. But I've got to make sure that I'm giving them the tools that's going to help them play what they want to play. Or I explain to them why that's not working and give them a chance to try to do something different that might match up a little bit different. So. Yep. And ultimately, it's our job to, to achieve the player's goals, mm -hmm. fit, the, fit the, the needs that they have in their unique way of playing the game. So that's what our, we're, all, we're all trying to achieve the same thing there. Mm -hmm. So now all of this stuff we've talked about, what are some different ways that we can practice with Specto? So this is uh, inside of the app. We're going to go back to, um, uh, this is just practice in general too, I think in the first one here. This is obviously the screen that most people are going to be on. And you can see even on this example here, this person's obviously been throwing some spares. They've been throwing their strike shots. And I think you kind of had a process that you like to encourage people to kind of stick through and think about when they're practicing. Yeah, I like to have them practice on one issue at a time actually. Can't change so, everything at the same time. Yeah, you, know, you can, but it's not as effective, right? <laughs> it's it's really tough for people to juggle exactly. six or seven things at one time, and end up usually they they do marginally at all of them rather than really great at any of them. So I try to focus them and have them discipline themselves to work on one issue at a time. And in the book, the Talent Code, that was kind of outlined as what we found in the great uh, training centers in the world in all different levels of endeavor or types of endeavor, not just sport, but also piano, violin, and every kind of uh, area of where people are striving for excellence. So working on one issue at a time and maybe slower speed is what I try to get players to do. And I found that when I have them do it in slower speed, that's another key component to helping them achieve the goal that I'm trying to get them to achieve. When they go back to normal speed and try something new, their body kind of reverts back to the old muscle memory, the old way of doing things. So I found that if I just focus them on one issue, but I also have them work on it in slower speed, mm -hmm. they achieve the goal much, much quicker. And the, in the Talent Code book uh, by Daniel Coyle, he identified this as 10 times faster in wow. improvement in speed That's by using what we call chunking and, uh, mm -hmm. and slower speed. So it's pretty powerful. I think Specto gives us the ability to decide what we're going to work on and I think we do it in, in uh, that kind of a fashion, one thing at a time in slower speed. We get those kind of results we saw earlier on the reports in right. one day where someone went all the way down to the pro level almost in every category uh, when they started out in a much different location. Yeah. So one of the ways related to this is uh, deep practice. So in the bottom right-hand corner, I believe it is, um, there's a deep practice button and you can put it in there and you can choose either one category to look at, which is the upper left one, or you can choose two categories. So, and then I think this here was kind of a suggestion for the way you have them actually practice once they go home. Yep, that's true. And, and deep practice again is the same thing we just talked about working on a specific issue and doing it with focus and maybe a little bit slower speed. And here we have um, a speed indicator on the ball and it's showing us where the green uh, dots are. They've gone within the range we've set, uh, and they've achieved the goal. When they see a red dot there on the uh, graph, it means they've gone outside the parameters we've set for them. So they get immediate feedback on every shot as to whether they're within the ranges we set or not, and they're just focused on that one thing for a mm -hmm. certain period of time, and they're getting immediate feedback, and they're starting to see success. And maybe for a while it'll be a little bit of success and a couple of failures, a little bit of success, a couple of failures, but eventually the failures start to fade away. Mm -hmm. Successful shots start to increase, mm -hmm. and that's how it always works in Definitely. improvement, right? It's never a, a smooth line. It's always a little bit of up and down, yep. but as you perform more and more, 
you see less and less mistakes and more and more successes. Right. So, and then a lot of times, uh, I think this was the suggestion you'd give when we were talking about it, is have them focus on the number one thing, and then take five minutes, make them reset their brain. They need to stop bowling, do something, go take a break, go think about something else, go have a chat with your friends, go have a drink in the bar if you need to. Whatever it is, just take a little bit of moment for you to reset, and then kind of now you can focus on the second item you want to work on. Yes. And then work on that for 20 minutes, because that was the other thing that I think that the talent code uh, focused on was uh, very uh, focused practice. Like yes. You wanted to pick your one topic and work very hard on it, then yep. reset, then move on to the next one, reset, and move on to the next one. Yep. Um, so. And during that reset time, you can also make some notations about how you did. Mm -hmm. Say, today I did like seven out of ten good shots. Yeah. And so I've got, I'm going to keep that on my practice plan, but it was last week it was only doing like four out of ten. Now I'm up to seven out of ten, so I see my practice, my improvement, and things are getting better. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another thing you can do during that little bit of a break time is just do a little bit of an assessment. Mm -hmm. So you can see uh, as your practice plan goes from week to week, you can see the improvement, and you can kind of point out maybe what you were feeling, what you were thinking that day, what seemed to work or what didn't work right. during that practice session. Very nice. So that was, this was kind of in relu to that. Also, the other thing I think you said was kind of mixing those focuses up. And don't always go in, okay, focus A, focus B, focus C. Go in one day, A, B, C, and then go in the next day and mix it up and go B, A, C, mix it up a little bit. And So you may have the same focuses, but don't always work on them exactly the same way. True, true. And uh, I think it's really good with, like, a good example is spare shooting. You know, if I shoot 10, 10, 10 pins in a row, I might get pretty good at shooting 10 pins, but... Ten pins don't usually happen ten in a row. They happen randomly, <laughs> they do, right? But you have to tell the strike yeah, them. <laughs> exactly. So I think it's good to have to have the things mixed up, like it happens in the real world. So you can have uh, your your issues and juggle them and, and sort them in different ways to challenge yourself and to give yourself that variety and build that uh, that ability to adjust any situation. Yeah. And I think also when we were talking about this, this wasn't only related to, okay, uh, problem A, problem B, problem C. This was like A game, B game, C game. So related back to the new report, the outside track, the middle track, the deep inside, force yourself to work on each of those skills for your versatility. Because this is, depending on what the player is working on, they're either working on their consistency or they're working on their versatility. And you can help them structure and help them understand how to structure their practices and how to develop both sides of their game at the same time. And there's some days that, I mean, there's certain times that I'll have a player that I only want them working on their consistency because I'm trying to change a specific element to their game. But then there's other times that I need them to balance between, okay, I need you to also get better at your game, but we've also get, got to get better at this element of the game. So you got to get better at playing deeper inside, or you got to get better on throwing the ball harder so that you can match up to those conditions better and things like that. So I'll, they're, depending on where we're at, and also a lot of times it's relative um, to where they're at in their competition cycle. If they've got a event coming up immediately, I'm probably not going to be working on their timing, their footwork, and their arm swing. I'm probably going to be more focused on how do I play first arrow, second arrow, third arrow? How do I adjust my speed? How do I match up with my equipment um, as I get closer to event? But if I'm right after an event, it's time that we can reset. Now maybe it's when I go back and I'm going to tear their footwork apart a little bit. And I'm going to be more picky and I'm going to be, okay, you've got to be within an inch here and within two inches there because now I don't have an event for six months. So if I take you a little bit backwards to fix the root cause that we haven't been able to fix, mm -hmm. this is a good time to do it. So. Yes. And I tell people usually I'm always tougher in the afternoon than I'm in the morning, you know, <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm coaching. And it's because when they get better at these things, as you saw in those examples I gave of the lesson sequence, uh, as they get better, then it, it, the little increments of progress are harder to achieve. And mm -hmm. you have to push a little harder. You have to be a little more dedicated and committed to the, yeah. to the situation. But what I like about SPECTO is here, once you outline your practice methods, whether it be a sequence of things or zone play or different tasks, once you and the coach kind of discuss those things, then you can take to the lanes without your coach mm -hmm. and you can work on those different issues, whatever they may be that you've chosen with your coach. Right. And you can do that all by yourself. And you can print the Spectre report out or, or show it to them on your on your mobile app mm -hmm. and go back to the coach next time you have an appointment and you can discuss the results you had. And so you can do a lot of work with Spectre there to kind of guide you without your coach having to be there with you. Right. And you can still review that at the next session that you have. Yeah, so absolutely. it's kind of a neat, neat tool that way, too. So this is the chart that's inside of the mobile app, which this is an accumulation of and an average of all of your data. Um, 
for any of the reports that you've done. So you'll see that these match very similarly what's the new report's going to have. So this is always a good reference point. And if I've got somebody that I know is using Specto regularly, a lot of times I'll have them pull this out and show it to me because it kind of gives me another, instead of doing a report, it gives me an idea of uh, where they're at there. So, But you can find that if you go to the hamburger menu up there and then click on performance. Mm -hmm. We've got some practice drills in there a little bit. Um, so again, when I'm helping some a player, uh, I mean, once I work with a player and I know what I've got them working on, there's if you go under the bottom here, you see live, my sessions, evaluations, and practices. If I click on that practice, there's a whole bunch of different uh, practices in here. And so like one of the example, the top one here is breakpoint zone proficiency. So most of them you can tell by the name what they're focused on. Mm -hmm. And this one is obviously working on that breakpoint zone. And you can go through there. There's ones for first arrow, second arrow, third arrow. There's ones for um, breakpoint in a, just like this one here. There's a zonal proficiency one that we use a lot at Weber. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have the players go through that every once in a while because what it does is it forces you to throw a certain number of shots in several different parts of the lane and then it gives you an accuracy in each of those zones. So these are good. If you've, a lot of times even with a clinic, uh, if we've got other things going on, and a lot of times if you're doing a group clinic, you've got eight people to work with. Well, you can only really focus on one when you're trying to change the physical game. So you can assign everybody else, okay, do some of these practice sessions and look over there. And there's some other ones in there that are neat to maybe go through. You can see the Finnish national team. Uh, they actually have some ones that they've developed in there, and you can kind of see what some of the things and the skills that they work on to get better. So it gives you a whole world perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. How we do things in the United States, yep. but also how they do that in Europe and some mm -hmm. other place. We can really be international uh, coaching students, I guess, right. if you will, with Specto. So now some of the other ways that you can practice with Specto is Worlds, which we talked about a little bit, was the guided practice. So it's a new way to practice with a purpose and have fun. So going into it a little bit more in depth, there's four different levels. You can choose your level, and then right now we only have four worlds. Eventually, we'll end up with ten at some point. But uh, you can't go on when you choose when you you can't go on to the next level till after you get at least one star in the previous level. So depending on the type of player, uh, you can keep continuing that until you accomplish all the tasks, or until you do it all five times, or you can move on as soon as you do it once. So and depending on different players, one of the things we've found this is especially helpful for is with younger players where they don't like to stay focused for, I mean, getting a kid to focus for 20 minutes on doing one task, mm -hmm. is that, that's not always the easiest thing to do. So the nice thing about this is it breaks it down into five shot, uh, five shot uh, focuses. So for those uh, lower level players or those younger players that don't have as much attention span, it's really easy for them. And you can see this is an example of what the very first level is, is basically you just got to keep it on the lane. And so you can see on that right side of the screen, they did that for the very first shot. So theoretically, they could move on to the next one now if they wanted to. But, mm -hmm. Or they could do that until they had all five of them and move on. So it's a really good practice session. As they go through it, they're going to earn stars for each level. And depending on the number of stars, you're going to learn earn medals. You can even earn a trophy. Mm -hmm. So you'll, earn, you'll see uh, how your progress is in this area. So it's a good way for... That's kind of a competition area, too, to where you can compare to some of your friends or have your students compare to each other and see who's making the most progress and things like that. So it's a really good, though, I think. Uh, primarily, I like this for people that, A, don't really know what they should be working on because it's going to guide you through some things. And as it guides you through, you're going to accidentally stumble on things. Wait, I couldn't do this one very good. That kind of gives me an idea. Maybe I'm not good at this uh, specific task, so maybe I need to find some ways to practice this specific task to get better at it. Because mm -hmm. likely, if they're not good at it in here, there's times in the game, I think, uh, depending between spares and ball changes and things like that, you've got to be able to do all the tasks that are in here at some point or another for you to be a good player. You've got to be able to accomplish all these. Yep. And I think for players of all ages, you know, sometimes practice becomes almost like work and it's, it, it gets kind of tough and, and maybe sometimes a little bit boring and it just, we, we lose our motivation to, to do it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And this time, this is kind of makes it a little bit more fun it certainly is challenging, and to get to another level, it's just like playing a video game. When pretty, a lot of people are pretty um, in into it in trying to get different levels in their video mm -hmm. games. Same thing happens here. You want to go to the next level. You want to make the next good shot. It kind of gives you that motivation, and also makes a little bit of fun. And that's what keeps people in our sport is having right. fun. Absolutely. And as they progress and get better, they're going to have even more fun because now they're going to score better. So I think this really makes a practice. Uh, it brings it up to a different level which I think is really positive. And I think Specto is, is a great way to get your game back and get your passion back for practicing mm -hmm. by using these games.
in these worlds. Okay. So the four worlds that we have, each world focuses on a different thing. So as you progress through them, you'll notice the first world is accuracy related tasks. The second one is going to be direction. So the first one, it's about hitting a certain spot uh, and usually a straight line. The next one is different uh, direction. So it's about hitting a different spot at the arrows than further down lane. So now you're having to change your direction for that. The third world is all speed related tasks. And then the fourth word world is a versatility tasks. Yep. So as you progress through those, they have different skill sets that get developed as well. And that's a pretty logical progression too. I think mm -hmm. you you have to have direction first, then you can work on other things, and then versatility is the ultimate when you get your game pretty much in order. Yeah. Then you become the versatile person. That's your yep. goal. So then the other area that we have is challenges. So the example I usually give people is. Um, it's kind of like people with their gym membership. Some people, they go to the gym and they can go every day and they are that person that can wake up and go every morning and they're very super dedicated. And then there's the other people that, well, they'll do it one day a week and they're going to go really hard for that one day a week, but they certainly aren't going to be as developed and they're probably going to be a little bit more inconsistent, much more like my gym membership. I was going to say, who, who are those people? I wonder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not me. So, But in the challenges, uh, what they focus on is just one specific task. So we've got two that are in there right now, the master corner pins, and a speed ladder, and you, we already talked about the fact that the speed was one of the most important two categories. Definitely is. And then I think everybody that's ever bowled in their life can agree that there's two pins down there that tend to give us more trouble than any other pins on the deck. And usually one of them is a bigger problem than the other one for most people. So I know for me, 10 pins, I know I'm going to leave it. It's a matter of whether I make it or not. And yeah. I should make them all, but yeah, I don't. So we'll just... but. That's definitely a task that if people specifically focus on, I, I can almost always improve somebody's game just by improving how well they can make specifically the 10 pin more often than not, or the seven pin if it's a lefty. So. Well, I think you know the seven pin is becoming more notorious now, even for right-handers. I'm finding that a lot of times right-handers now are missing left side spares almost as much or more than they are right side oh, wow. spares. You know. Probably because so, that puddle of oil on the middle. Yeah, yeah it could be it. <laughs> create some havoc for them. So they're both very important, no matter what side you bowl from, I think. So this is a good, the nice part about the challenges is it's one specific task. How many times in a row I can uh, can I do it? I can do this specific corner pins ones. I can either do just seven pins. I can do the seven and ten together and alternating back and forth, or I can do just the ten pins. And the nice part about this is it also has leaderboards on there, so I can compare to my bowling center. I compare right. to who was the best in the last month. I can compare to, it shows me on the screen the all-time best ever everywhere, but so it kind of gives me a frame of reference there too. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice way to compete. Uh, it's an easy way to compete with my friends and try to say, yeah, I could make 10, 10 pins in a row. I wish, but I, I could make 10, 10 pins in a row. Can you beat me at that? So right. speed ladder, like he said already, that's the number two category. Um, you can choose your difficulty, which you'll see the difficulty ranges up there as you can maybe in no way. When you throw your first shot, it's your baseline. Uh, just like with kind of the first report perspective is your baseline report. And then every shot after that, you can see it throws a range up there. So the first shot for this person was 14.16. And now they had it set on the you can range. So now they had all the way from 13.54 to 14.79. So you can see how many shots in a row that they would have to do to get complete. And this was actually uh, um, the all-time best on this one is 114. If you get down into the no way, though, I believe the all-time best in the no way is still like in the 9 or 10. Isn't that about right under? Somewhere in that lower level. So it's still it can be pretty competitive, and it's a lot harder to accomplish that task than what you mm -hmm. might think. So. Right. But like we talked about, is on the leaderboards, I can narrow those down. I can look at different... Uh, um, what the I can filter it by where I am in the world. I can fil filter it by time. So who is it this week? Uh, so it's really easy for me to create competitions with my friends and my buddies, mm -hmm. um, or would just uh, kind of uh, figure out where I actually fit relative to the rest of the world. So um, was there anything else you wanted to say about leaderboards? I didn't see your name on there. <sighs> no, it's not on there for some you, reason. You uh, uh, yes, I, I forgot to put my practice session on. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> well, I see KT. Or maybe I didn't make the leaderboard KT's. for some reason. Uh oh. Uh. <laughs> so. So this was the primary stuff that we wanted to cover. So now we'll switch over to chat and try to catch up with some of the questions that came through. Yeah. Oh, boy, there's a bunch of them in here. Most important things are these questions. Uh, 
that's why we're here today. Okay, so we'll go back all the way to the beginning of them. So as far as uh, Mervin, as far as how Specto and Clutch are working together, Clutch, in case you aren't familiar with it, is a uh, projection system. And what they do is they are actually um, selling their system now, including Clutch with it, but they're a projection system that they use Specto data, so they're using a similar sensor to us, and they can actually project on the lane. So you've probably seen it before. Um, it's uh, overhead projectors that put onto the lane. Um, and they take the specto data and they can use that to either draw lines. So there's some practice items that they have in there, but most of their stuff is entertainment based. So they have like a game that has orcs coming up the game, uh, the lane and things like that. So, uh, let's see. How can you upload the pattern in the coaching app and what format does it have to be? Uh, Matthias, the, in the coaching app, you should be able to use the most current version of the Kazi file. There's two ways to do it. You can either use the Kazi file PDF and you can upload that. If that doesn't do it correctly, because we have several different versions of Kazi files out there, if that doesn't do correctly, you'll see it'll look weird and it'll either be way too narrow or way too long. Um, then what you can do is actually crop out the pattern itself and save it as either a JPEG or a PNG. Um, and to just keep the distance of the pattern in the name of the file. So like, let's say it was a 40 foot pattern, a house pattern 40. What I could do is take that Kazi file, crop out just the pattern part of it, turn it over landscape. So it was laying flat and then name it house pattern 40 and then select that file when I'm uploading it. And it would actually, sh uh, it would actually upload it that way. So try that. If you have trouble with it, um, feel free to email me or call me. You can find my website. I probably should have put my, uh, address on, or my email address is on the end here, but it's on the website, but it's brent.sims at kegel.net if you have trouble with it, uh, and we can help you with that. So, um, sorry, delete your shots. Reverate seems extra generous. Reverate is using, uh, speed as one. It's a calculation. It's the only calculation that's really in there. So sometimes if you get a player that throws it really straight and really hard, it will be a little generous there. But more often than not, if ball motion's good, it's going to be pretty close. Yes. That's been my experience too. Is you can have a, an errant shot or a shot that, like Brent said, uh, skids in the oil a lot or, or whatever. You're using a ball that doesn't have much friction. But it, overall, I think the uh, when it comes down to it, the rev rate is pretty consistent as long as you see some pretty good ball motion. And uh, when you and again, the relative change in rev rate is also valuable. Uh, so say it's a little generous, but if it's generous and it's uh, you, you go up and down by 50, that's still a change in 50. Yeah. So uh, it's, I think it's pretty helpful and uh, pretty consistent overall. And I've learned to trust it a lot more than I first did when I first started using it. Uh, to answer your question, Jeremy, yes, we'll have this up. We'll post it up on YouTube probably in the next day or so. We will get an email with the replay options as well. I think I had it disabled because I think I had it told to save it, but not. But, but you should get a follow-up email too that would give you that information. Um, thank you, Al, for the comment. Uh, Jimmy, as far as when the uh, um, well, loft is distance will be gone, as soon as the new report comes out, the category technically will still be there, but uh, we don't use it for anything. So it will be probably towards the end of this month, the beginning of the next month. Um, to answer your next question about standard deviation instead of range, you can always, inside of the Coaches app, you can always export the raw data, and then you could analyze it, and you could actually put standard deviation calculations and things like that on there if you wanted. We don't use that here. Uh, we prefer range. Uh, but if you wanted to do those types of things yourself, either A, you could calculate them manually, which I wouldn't do, but you could put them, you can export it to a uh, the data file, and the data file will spit the data out, and then you could uh, calculate it in other ways if you wanted to see it in uh, different directions. Um... Uh-oh. She writes left and bulls right, so you and Brandon have something. Oh, my gosh. Two of us in the world. Uh, I agree with you, Lloyd. I wish every bowling center had spec, though. Uh, what were some of the drills used with this player? Oh, I don't remember which player we were talking about then. It's, the one, it's the one in the, in the report. The lesson. Oh, okay. Yeah, the lesson. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think I'm, I'm always – I usually use the finish drill. Uh, which is where you go to the foul line and put your feet together at the foul line, put the ball in front of your right knee and put your balance arm up with the thumb pointed down. And then you let the ball hang uh, by your side and uh, get your tread leg out of the way. So you're balanced on your slide foot, tread leg out of the way. Then you push the ball with muscle 
forward about 12 inches and then let it go back and then forward by gravity. So it's a push forward 12 inches. Then the ball comes back by gravity and goes forward by gravity and goes down the lane very, very slowly. Most people who do the finish row the first time make a mistake of throwing it really hard, <laughs> 10 times harder than they should. So this should be a, a ball that really just creeps down the lane very slowly. And you're just trying to get your body in that finish position where your body is tilted to the right. Your head is over the top of the ball. Uh, your shoulders are dropped. Your tray leg is helping you balance and you're solid at the finish. Your head doesn't move. Your shoulders don't rotate because you're only just swinging the ball from the shoulder. So it puts you in all those postures. It gives you the feeling of a, a gravity controlled swing. Uh, the ball is close to the ankle, which gives you leverage and more revs. Uh, so that finish drill really creates four or five, maybe even six different aspects of the game that are very, very important. So we use it a lot. In fact, with our college team, they do this drill every single day for all four years that they're here. And some of them stay for five years. So the drill is very, very important. And even some of our college bowlers that have gone on to be professionals, when they come back here to Kegel, they have lifetime access to our facility here. They still do the drills. And I point that out to my students when they're here, uh, like Barry Crawley, who's on the professional women's tour, and Daria Payok. They both come back and they do the finish drill, even though they don't have to anymore. But during college, they had to do it. Now they do it because they know that it still keeps their game in shape. So that's one of the drills I do. But again, I also focus a lot, as I said, on the setup. Uh, I think it's really an undervalued part of the game. A lot of people would take it for granted because they think it's a beginner issue. But I found that a lot of advanced players get really sloppy in their setup and don't uh, do not do it carefully. Uh, I don't think the pros do that, right, Brent? They're pretty careful about their setups, mm -hmm. what you see. Uh, maybe a few. <laughs> uh, but, of course, they bowl 100 games a week, so they can get away okay. with some variations like that. But for the rest of us, I think our setup is very, very important. So I look at that as well. Um, Al, as far as the mobile spec, though, I will just say stay tuned um, and keep a close eye on our website and then at first quarter of next year, uh, but likely you'll see something soon. Uh, ball performance test for one, uh, what pattern ratio? The nice thing about this report is the pattern ratio doesn't play as big of an effect because that was one of the first things when we were developing we were worried about is because a house pattern mold uh, kind of meshes these bowling balls all up to look similar. We were worried about having to have a tougher pattern out. The nice thing that we found through testing was by looking at the categories and specifically the speed slowdown and the angles, it's really easy to see uh, what the difference is between the balls regardless of how easy or hard the pattern is. So, um, yeah, if you haven't done that ball performance test, I really encourage you to try it out. It's really amazing. Your bowlers will love it. Um, Danny, as far as I think I kind of nudged at this when I was talking about the ball surface change, a lot of times it depends on how I'm using it. Sometimes I will do it right out of the box. However they're using it is usually how I'm going to do it. But sometimes I'll change it and I'll do a, well, this is what it is at 2000. This is what it is polished. And then we have some ideas. And then it gives us an idea because maybe polished, it fits into their arsenal. But 2000, it's too much. It's too close to another ball in their arsenal. So it helps me adjust and, and uh, put it to get, uh, out. So. Um, Jimmy, I think we talked about a minute ago about some of the varying from shot to shot as far as the RPM at the different centers. Um, every once in a while, I'll also get an error if it has blind spots. But if you uh, want to email me specifically and kind of give me some ideas of exactly what you're seeing, I can probably better look at the information and give you an idea. Uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel, the video on demand, which you may not be here anymore, we will post that up on uh, YouTube probably within the next couple of days. Uh, Danny, we did not show the target line tool. I discussed it, but I didn't show an example of it here. Um, Danny, for the challenges for the, I'm assuming you're asking about the corner pins, whether it works with a full rack or do you have to have a single spare up? It does it by where the ball's at. It doesn't look at the pins. So it's all based on you can do it with no pins or you can do it with all the pins. It wouldn't really matter. Either way, you could do it. Um, thank you, Antonio, for the comment. Uh, Jeremy, as far as how to export the raw data. Um, oh, that's a good question. I think when you do the uh, when you're saving the report, I think one of the options. Yeah, no, I was just going to log in real quickly and see it, though. I think when you do it, when you're saving the report, it shows up under there. You can change the file type. Uh, 
Well, I did answer that, but yeah, for so it could work either with a full rack. Because remember, it uses for the challenges whether it uses full rack or the single spare up. It's doing it specifically by where the ball's at. It calculates it, so you don't need. You can have all the pins there. Or you can have no pins there. It wouldn't matter. So, um, but uh, Jeremy, what I would say is when you're saving the report. Underneath the file save as, you can change the file type there. But send me an email later, and I can send you a quick video showing you exactly how to do it. And then it exports it into, I think it's an Excel file, but it might be a data file. I don't remember exactly which one, but I know it does one of the two. So, Any other questions, anything else we can help with? I will type my email address inside of chat if you have any other questions. Oops, I should spell my name right, though. Feel free to give me a email or I will also type Rick's if it's a difficult question send it to him please oh yeah right <laughs> by the way that, did anybody answer about whether they have spec in their local area or not did you see anything there Brent on that well the one guy said he's got access to it in five different centers so. the third oh yep seventy percent of people had access to oh, really great that's really good to know I'm so happy then I hope you really take advantage of some of the things we talked about uh, as far as that analysis report and the comparisons to the pros and also the ball performance test. Again, I really want to emphasize how valuable that can be to you and to your players. Uh, what was that? Latine uh, bowl play. Uh, the coaches software is only available on windows. It's only windows 8.1 or greater. So as of right now, we're not planning to uh, do any development on the Mac side. Uh, not related. Ask Alex when Accelerator is coming up for sale. Uh, you're you're exposing our other R and D here, Antonio. I'm gonna have to export you from the uh, or expel you from the uh, thing. <laughs> now we are always working on new uh, new tools, so we I would encourage you to keep an eye on it. As of right now, we don't have a specific. Unfortunately, we aren't uh, accelerometer makers. So it's a little harder to be able to source one that we have the room that we're able to actually do some development and sell it. So. Thank you for the comment, Andy. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, Juan. If there's no other questions. We'll go ahead and call it to an end. Uh, like I said, please feel free to email me, text me. You can always call us here in the office. I'll be happy to uh, answer whatever questions I have, um, and I'm always here to uh, help out. And we have lots more Specto units to sell, so if you'd like to buy one, give us a call, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't forget our other coaching tools. So. That's right. Yeah, Alexander Gurkov we have here. He's our secret weapon. There will be many more coaching duels coming out in the future. You can bet on that. Well, thank you again. Take care, guys. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you and presentation and kisses to Ander. See, you corrected her name, so she loves you. <laughs> she, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Go ahead and end it.